Uh, welcome uh, everyone to uh, today's presentation on customs hot topics. Uh, today's topic is verification and audits, methods and measures. And what we plan to give you is a playbook or a field manual for navigating the process uh, if and when you do uh, experience uh, uh, customs uh, verification or audit and a customs officer comes knocking on the door. Um, next slide, please. Usual disclaimer, we're providing background and not legal advice. If you need legal advice, uh, please contact an experienced lawyer. Next slide, please. So uh, your hosts today uh, include myself. I lead the uh, Global Trade and Customs Practice. I'm licensed in BC, in Ontario, and in New York. And a significant area of my practice is Canadian uh, verifications and US customs audits. And uh, Dave, uh, a veteran, uh, uh, seasoned veteran customs broker uh, and uh, VP of Carson International. Over to you, Dave. Yeah, um, good morning or good afternoon, whichever part of Canada you're in. I'm pleased to join Dan today. Um, I'm uh, the Senior Vice President of Compliance at Carson International. Um, I actually get excited about compliance issues um, and certainly solving uh, problems. Um, uh, when they're presented either by U.S. Customs or uh, Canada Customs. So I look forward to today's session with uh, Dan. So um, I, I guess before we kick off the topic today, um, I've done a number of these and it's all, I almost always want to go into it thinking that uh, compliance is one of those things that it, it's viewed by a lot of people. It's like looking forward to root canal at the dentist. However, at the end of this 30 minutes, or if we, if we can keep it to 30 minutes, I hope that you actually look forward to a compliance um, audit sometime. And, and that seems like a strange conversation to kick today off. However, um, if you're prepared for a compliance audit, if you go through one and have a success one, there's a good chance that you won't see one again for a very, very long time. So um, I think the key of everything today will be on uh, preparation. So I'll turn it back to you, Dan. Yeah, onto the next slide. I, th uh, I think that's a, a great point, David. Uh, that uh, the place of inner nirvana or Zen is a place where you want to be able to welcome an audit. Next slide. There are, oh, did we move forward? Yes, uh, there, there are lots of different types. And uh, generally we see the single program verification audit uh, as of late. Uh, the CBSA especially uh, picks on one issue, say valuation, where they can see that there's possible money and they go after it. Um, and as we'll discuss later on, there are priorities in specific areas, including um, the, um, uh, the typical issues of valuation, classification and origin. Uh, customs officials that also administer legislation for other governmental agencies environmental agencies, food and drugs, import taxes, and so forth. Um, and, and they can be uh, complex uh, and consuming for the uninitiated. There is a uh, policy guidance that instructs officers on how to do them. And you can use that uh, policy guidance uh, to your advantage uh, if you know what's in there. David, any comments? I uh, know that both Canada and the United States operate in the, uh, similar worlds. Um, um, whether they're either being focused on certain aspects, but they, they both, I, I would say that if you uh, adapt um, uh, a preparation program in place or, or follow these guidelines, the specifics may be a little different for each country, but you know, all in all, the general um, uh, concept of getting ready for it is, is, is uh, true to both countries, so yeah. Okay, next slide. So uh, there is a method, a rhythm, a process for uh, carrying out an audit. Uh, there are distinct phases. Uh, I've listed a few there. It's really, you start off with a request. Uh, in the CBSA context, they often get a notice of a, a letter saying, hey, we exist and we wanna do a verification. Uh, then there is the review process. Uh, they'll ask for certain documents and you got uh, say typically 30 days to uh, start to engage and provide information. Uh, sometimes there's a visit uh, where the verification officer will come uh, to the location. Uh, sometimes it may be a non-resident importer, say located in California where it's nice and sunny. 
and um, they have a little visit and see how the process uh, uh, in, in the facility works. Uh, then there may be a uh, stage where you communicate further with the CBSA and uh, the officer ends up writing a report and it, it deals with the issues of, of compliance. You'll have a, usually an opportunity to respond to that report uh, and disabuse the officer of any concerns that he or she may have. And then a final report will be issued if there is um, areas where there um, is a compliance issue there that report can end up uh, involving a customs duty assessment. The CBSA and the CBP processes are similar but not identical. And so what what is the government really looking for at the bottom? Uh, strong internal controls. Uh, can you track the entries and support the declarations made? Strong processes and procedures. This instills confidence that uh, that the business is taking the issue of customs uh, seriously and strong uh, corporate records, ensuring that there's continuity of knowledge uh, respecting how declarations are made. Uh, so uh, again, uh, a trade compliance verification manual in the CBSA context instructs officers on how to ask about uh, things and how to carry on a, a, a verification a customs audit in Canada. David? Yeah, I mean, the main comment I have is that um, everybody within the company, if you get a, uh, a letter from either um, Canada Customs CBSA or US Customs CBP, um, don't uh, dismiss it or take it lightly. It, it's usually the first volley and it may sound friendly, um, but there's no such thing these days as a random customs audit. They are targeted and there's a reason that they're sending this letter out to you. So, you know, you should not dismiss it and Often it goes to somebody fairly senior within the company who may sit on his desk before he sends it down to somebody within your company um, to look further at. But um, you should always have a point person within the company and again, um, monitor it and set things up. It's just not a letter that uh, the customs agencies are sending out because they have lots of time and energy, it's focused. So uh, start strong and um, you know, take it seriously from the get-go. So. Reminds me of the saying that uh, we're here from the government and we're here to help, right? Yeah, exactly. On to the next slide. Preparation. Uh, this is uh, pretty important. I think this is the biggest takeaway. If you can do anything now to prepare for an audit in the future, I would encourage you to do it because it's 10 times more expensive to solve a problem that exists than it is to prevent a problem going forward. Um, and so ideally, as I mentioned, the, the point of uh, Zen is to be prepared to welcome an audit if somebody comes uh, and, and asks you for information. We know that's not always the case, but it's an aspirational goal. Uh, so uh, what do you wanna look for? Uh, first of all, I think the accounting systems. In the next slide uh, that uh, David and Carson have uh, outlined, uh, we'll touch on this uh, in detail. The point is to properly account for things, for matters that are relevant to customs, payments that may be on account of goods, the cost of goods sold. Sometimes the uh, government considers the inclusion of management of, uh, and, and service fees relating to back office services that have been provided by a related company in the US to a Canadian subsidiary and they want to include that information. If you don't include it, have a position uh, outlined uh, so that you're ready to meet the, the, uh, the concern. Dealing with royalties and transportation and, 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 those, uh, and assists, those are things that uh, are regularly coming up on a valuation uh, issue or valuation audit. Similarly, there'll be issues that will pop up on origin and classification. So uh, the other uh, areas I've mentioned here, Entry document packages, uh, having, having uh, you know the the right documents available and uh, easily accessible uh, are are important. Uh, self assessment and review systems. Sometimes it's nice to be able to say we do have a system we uh, for dealing with corrections, especially in a business where there are um, you know typically corrections that are made. I'm thinking of say the mining uh, industry where where. Uh, you know, shipments of ore might be uh, declared on a provisional basis and then it is trued up 
at the end of the month according to the London Metal Exchange values, that kind of stuff. Uh, other governmental programs, export controls, environmental, and uh, how to prepare. Uh, it, you know, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about this, but documenting the uh, reporting methods and having a systems and processes manual of, of, of some sort, uh, which will guide the business, even if the key person that's currently responsible has, has left the company or is not available. David? Yeah, maybe just go to the next slide and then I'll kind of try and put this into perspective. So first off, a lot of importers don't realize, both in the United States and Canada, that your broker is submitting information to customs. So when you're taking part in a uh, customs verification in Canada, I'm talking about now, um, they have not seen the documents used to uh, clear shipments. And the broker is just submitting information based on documentation and the documentation must be kept by the both the importer and, and the broker for six years. And that's happened for the last 20 years in Canada. They, they just they got out of uh, document retention um, uh, many, many years ago. In the United States, in the last five or six years, they've gone to a strictly digital um, uh, capturing of information as well. So when you're asked to prevent, uh, present information to them, it is the very first pass that they've seen at the documents. And, and for a lot of importers, especially small, medium-sized ones, that's kind of a shock to them. Um, and they think that that invoice that is sent to the broker is going to customs. It's not. We're just submitting information on parameters, on fields that are specific to the customs entry. So it's really important that uh, a verification trail starting with the entry in, in, in this, um, I have to apologize for the date on this. This actually goes back to, I noticed we had an old logo on there. We probably use this example for uh, probably close to 15 years. And it's really just to show where things in our world really start when we see an invoice. However, in the verification trail, this is the linkage that customs is looking for. They're really looking that the purchase order, um, if it's got 10 widgets on it, matches with the invoice, with the quantity and the value. The way bill shows that, the customs entry dictates that, the receiving report, and that you paid your vendor and is reported in your general ledger, sub ledgers and journals, exactly what was on the purchase order. Now that doesn't always happen. There's gaps where people short ship things. The, uh, the value declared on the invoice is not what it was on the purchase order. But in customs world, if there's one thing you could take away is this is the linkage they're looking for. So they're not looking at documents in isolation. These documents are all being linked together. So I would uh, strongly urge you to kind of take this. Uh, if there's one takeaway from today, I would say this is a great starting point and it's more complex than this, but it certainly is a great basis to start the verification trail. So yeah. and, and it, it, typically they'll start off with a sample set, say five or up to 25 samples. And they'll say, hey, give us your document package relating to these samples and show us how you did it. And they'll be looking for this type of information. In my experience, that's what they want. Um, if you uh, are able to provide that, that's great. If you're not, then, uh, and there's, there, or there's things that are out of place, then that's a, you know, it's an, an indicator of reliability and they might want to drill deeper into certain things. Anything about the, any thoughts on that, David? Uh, yeah, I, I guess the, the biggest point is that uh, um, the uh, very simple letter that will come to you, now I'm talking about in Canada, will strictly have a customs entries on it. Best thing for you to do is contact your broker because I've yet to find many importers who file by entry numbers only. There won't be dates on it. It'll just be an entry number. And so without uh, looking too deeply within your company, just give your broker a call. They'll have the entry number. They'll be able to give you all the documents that they use to file the entry. You should obtain all those that they had. And from there, then you would look at building the information. And before you send it to customs, maybe have a quick look to make sure that there's nothing glowing and outstanding. Um, that there's that will set off any uh, alarm bells with customs. So. 
David, there's a little uh, question in the chat, for Lisa, uh, she, uh, maybe this is a stump your teacher uh, question, but we'll, we'll ask it. Um, how many people really have a process for three-way match of advanced payments in a centralized location? Any thoughts on that? Um, probably not as many as should be. Um, <laughs> okay. it, it's it, a lot of, you know, the biggest thing I've been involved with some with large audits is that customs often finds that accounting functions within companies operate in isolation from the purchasing and receiving people. Yeah. And, and that's one that you need to show some kind of linkage. Um, so. Right. I, I mean, I've, I've had involvement in, in, in businesses which might have, uh, you know, uh, 77 different um, units uh, or subsidiaries and they, um, all use the same uh, sort of uh, custom central services and things are all over the place. So um, it's, it's a bit of a uh, case by case situation when you're looking at where, where is everything. Yeah. And, and, and customs is well aware that things often aren't centralized, especially with larger companies. Um, uh, you know, both Canada and the United States, they will demand that you produce information within 30 days you can always go to them. And certainly in this, um, uh, you know, COVID environment, there's people asking for extensions on that. If you're going to ask for extensions, it's much better to ask well in advance. Don't wait till the 29th day to ask for extension. Y if you get the letter, um, take a look at it, what's required, ask for the extension right away, just saying the size of your organization, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah, it, in the past, what we've done is, is we've helped some companies, uh, you know, do a gap analysis, assess their current state and their future, the desired future state. And maybe it's, you know, having their systems and processes more in a line and getting them to, uh, you know, implement the uh, strategy uh, to get them into uh, a desired future state. So that that is possibly an area where uh, things can be streamlined to make it easier in the event of an audit. Next slide. And so that slide there is just the verbiage I was talking about with the diagram. Pretty yeah. Much. Okay. So let's move looking on. for linkages. So. Yeah. Verification priorities. Unlike the income tax folks, CBSA telegraphs what's on the hit parade. And so we get to know, uh, as far as they are willing to disclose, what are the big audit priorities for you know the next six months this comes out every every six months january and june i believe and so this is uh, january's iteration uh, apparel and footwear for example and valuation i don't think they ever come off uh, and um, they say no origin uh, priorities but i would imagine that they're going to look at uh, usmca uh, as being a priority even though it's not stated here and then we get into uh, tariff classification. And these are issues that have popped up for whatever reason as um, areas where people have uh, made errors in classification. And it's often a situation where the, another classification gives you a lower value for du uh, 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 duty rate um, and, and the correct classification according to customs is a higher duty rate. Yeah, and I guess my, my comment would be a lot of these verification priorities are not strictly drummed up from customs. They start with Statistics Canada, drives a lot of these priorities. They'll actually see an uptick in certain um, commodities that are coming into the country, and they actually uh, go to customs and ask for them to take a look into, uh, in, into certain uh, categories of goods. So. Next slide, please. Uh, this is my favorite, uh, act like a duck. Uh, look calm on the surface, but paddle like hell underneath. That's what you want to do with this, a CBSA verification or a, a CBP audit. You want to do what you want to be able to do is to convey a sense that you're on top of things, and you can do that by uh, you know quickly responding, and then telling the uh, the agency you know how uh, how uh, long you expect to be ideally. Uh, and if there's any hiccups, uh, give them a, a, an advance warning of that. Get all the information that they ask for as quickly as possible. Don't delay. And, uh, and uh, so uh, 
you know, the, uh, the way of doing this in a larger organization is to uh, manage up, tell the uh, boss that, uh, hey, we've got this audit or this verification. We got we to gotta look after this thing because it's, it's important. And it could uh, end up uh, representing a cost or a savings to our, our organization if we look after this properly. So understand the consequences of failing an audit uh, is important and being able to communicate that to the uh, persons who are, you know, uh, wanting to know this type of information. Providing pr prompt and succinct responses is also important and seeking advice on difficult or tricky questions, usually legal in nature, uh, involving uh, the application of policies is, is probably a good idea. David? Uh, yeah, I think the next slide's gonna talk about it, but I mean, uh, the biggest thing I always tell people is um, make management understand that this is not a uh, frivolous uh, issue and it's serious. You need some time to dedicate to this and you need to appoint a single spokesperson because I've seen a few, uh, well, more than a few audits that have uh, seen um, increased in time and complexity because customs has reached out to multiple people within the company. They may not all have the same um, answers and point of view from their specific positions within the company. So I think you should always appoint one person and, and, and if it, uh, uh, ratchets up scale and you, you, you involve your broker uh, or and or a, a competent trade attorney like Dan and his company, you need to make them aware um, of what you're um, providing to customs as well. So, um, it, and, and that's just one of those things that uh, if you have one lead a person, just based on my past experience, um, you're gonna have less issues, so. Good point, next slide. So David made this point, you don't want to have a multi-headed hydra giving instructions and receiving information, uh, you know, have a lead. And in some cases, in, uh, you know, smaller companies may just want to have a company representative or business representative lead the thing and have the advisor, the broker, those folks, the team in the background uh, and not make a big deal out of things. In other situations, larger companies, more significant issues, a lot more at stake. It's not uncommon at all for a lawyer to uh, or a broker to lead the uh, the uh, communication with the CBSA. So have a lead, and and uh, everybody stays in their lane. So uh, the lead spokesman receives all information and sends all information and documents. The side on the scope that should be in the in the first communication by the customs officer. What's the scope? What's the relevant period? What's the issue? Uh, and then determine what policies apply. I mean, there may be policies that apply to various things. And uh, uh, one I mentioned already is, is how, in fact, the, uh, the uh, verification or audit is to be conducted. And uh, knowing, I, I spoke about the communication roles, but know the theory of your case, I'm using a litigation term, but the basis for the positions that have been advanced on verification or audit issues. So if it's valuation, what's the basis for your valuation? What have you included? And what did you deduct or not include in the value for duty of goods? David? Uh, yeah, I, I would say that scope is probably the biggest one. And, and um, customs, uh, they're mandated that if they pick five entries and those are the entries, then they're confined to those five entries. Um, and, and I tell people that it, it's sort of like being pulled over for speeding. You just answer the questions to the police officer that concern the speeding ticket. You don't tell them that you blew a red light while you were speeding. Um, you, you make it focused on exactly what they're looking at and don't get into anything else. So, yeah, good point. Uh, on to the next slide. Uh, typical CBSA issues, we've run through a few. Uh, class, we see uh, classification issues pop up quite regularly on anti-dumping and countervailing du duties. You know, a few of the examples, aluminum extrusions, furniture, computer components, and so forth. Um, and then a possible application of punitive tariffs on supply managed goods. Uh, though that's a big area as well. So, you know, things like chicken products, uh, beef, et cetera, um, dairy products such as buttermilk and ice cream. Those uh, 
things, if they're misclassified, can end up uh, running you 300% uh, duty approximately. So it's very punitive. And then there are the run of the mill, I'd say garden variety increased uh, tariffs resulting from the misclassification of goods. And there's a few of them that we've experienced in the past. The Mr. Noodles case uh, was one where it was a, went from a soup uh, to a noodle according, according to, um, well, went from a noodle to a soup, I should say. And there was a duty that was accrued on that thing. And we uh, had it reversed in the CITT. Hardwood flooring, another example, floating LNG vessels, I believe that was at 25%. So classification uh, is a big issue uh, in, in several respects, David. Yeah, my comments would be, um, it's probably why um, uh, footwear and clothing is always on their, their hit list because uh, traditionally, other than anti-dumping and countervailing duties and supply managed goods, those are the highest tariff rates at 18%. Um, and, and, and I guess a word of warning is that uh, you have to watch if customs looks as if they just want to change classifications um, you need to quickly take a look to where they want to change it to and to make sure that they, it's not falling within something that's uh, subject to anti-dumping, countervailing duty, duties, or supply managed goods. So um, you, you don't be led uh, down the path um, that it's just a, a minor misclassification. Maybe take a look at uh, the end result before you uh, get into agreeing to anything. So, All right. Next slide, please. Valuation, uh, non-resident importers seem to be on the hit parade uh, quite frequently. Every year, there's a new set of verifications that seem to target non-resident importers, especially as David has mentioned in the apparel and footwear industry, because it's 18% duty, I suppose. And uh, key issues that we see come up uh, on valuation are uh, whether or not there has been a prior sale before the goods have been imported for a non-resident importer, because that can, that issue, the resolution of that issue can impact the value for duty. And, and obviously the non-resident importer wants to use the supply cost, uh, which will be lower than the ultimate customer cost as the, uh, as the basis for the valuation for duty. In order to do that, usually uh, what uh, the non-resident importer wants to be able to show is that forecasts are not sales orders or bookings are not sales orders and that the goods are coming in as unsold inventory and then they are sold domestically in, in the country. So um, another issue that we've seen is if there's no sale prior to import, say the goods are built somewhere else or they've been held in the US and then they're imported, uh, and there's no uh, sales transaction, uh, no sales for export to a purchaser in Canada, what's the valuation method? And so we've been uh, noodling through that and we've had several cases where, where uh, we've, uh, sorry folks, uh, we've had a situation where we've had to deal with those, uh, those tricky issues. David? Yeah, I, my comments would be, um, we're almost doing a disservice talking about a couple of minutes about valuation. It's such a deep, uh, topic and it's so involved these days because uh, um, valuations aren't just people uh, lowering values to bring goods in. They're actually, I've been involved where customs have said the values are too high and that gets into uh, companies, uh, usually multinationals, trying to make as much profit in lower tax areas than, uh, than higher tax areas. So it, it's something that you know, um, if you're an uncomplicated company buying from vendors who are not related at all, it's, it's a probably a much easier uh, topic to tackle. However, uh, our world is a very complex world these days and, and companies seem to be purchasing other companies around the, the globe. And certainly if you're multinational, this is where you need to get into transfer pricing studies and, and a much, much deeper dive in valuation. And this, if you're that kind of company, you need to do some homework much farther ahead of time than waiting for customs to come calling on your door. So, Yeah, I think that's important. It, it, something called volumetrics. So if you have something that is repeatedly done over time, it is going to end up being big. And uh, the duty consequences of being incorrect 
are going to be big as well. So you want to make sure before you get going that you check all the boxes and that you can fit all the categories and that you can hit that sport, uh, point of nirvana if the CBSA comes knocking, especially in non-resident importers and valuation issues. Next slide, please. Uh, so we talked about this uh, a bit, uh, whether or not the importer is a purchaser in Canada. Uh, if you are a non-resident importer, you would like to be a purchaser in Canada. And the two main methods are uh, importing as inventory, I mentioned that, and uh, having a permanent establishment. You can have a permanent establishment without being a resident. A resident for customs purposes is a business that has mind and management in Canada. You don't need to have mind and management in Canada. You can have a fixed place of business through which you can carry on business through one or more employees. And uh, so if you check that box, if you can meet that category, you can have a permanent establishment, you can be a purchaser in Canada, and you can meet the valuation rules such that you can use the lower supply cost or the valuation for duty and avoid using the customer cost, the higher customer cost for that value. David? Um, <laughs> This is too deep in the weeds to even get into it. Anyway. <laughs> I think if, uh, if anybody's got issues as far as whether they believe they're purchaser in Canada, I think um, maybe drop us a line or give us a call. It, yeah. It's very complicated, um, but it's best that you're aware um, uh, how your goods or, or how your value is determined before customs asks. So I'm going to leave it. I, I think a, a one illustration of how uh, complicated it can be is, you know, uh, folks have uh, said that they're a permanent establishment and as, as a result, they're a purchaser in Canada and they can use the supply cost. But um, the CBSA has taken the position they don't have a permanent establishment because they don't have a, an employee in Canada. They have people that pop up from time to time from the U.S. and do work through the fixed place of business, but they don't meet the... Um, permanent establishment rules, which uh, by policy require uh, employees or dependent agents. So very critical, do your homework upfront and make sure that you fit uh, the definitions uh, and that you have squared away uh, your position uh, before you get started and doing a lot of importing because the consequences of not uh, being right could be significant. Uh, other scenarios I've mentioned here, corrections to provisional declarations. Uh, if, if there's some reason that you need to uh, correct going forward or whatnot, uh, have a process for doing that. Inclusions for uh, uh, items that need to be added for value, uh, for duty purposes, uh, transportation, royalties or assists and transfer pricing, I've mentioned that. On to the next slide. Uh, Current valuation priorities are apparel and footwear for transfer pricing. Um, and um, transfer pricing impacts related party uh, sales. And, and so you have to be able to show, if you're going to use the transaction value, that the relationship between the uh, related parties didn't affect the value. That is usually that they, it didn't artificially suppress the value so that you're paying an artificially low amount of duty. That's what the CBSA is worried about. Uh, so there are similar objectives and policies of customs valuation and income tax transfer pricing. In customs, they're worried about the suppression of the value so that uh, they don't they want to make sure that you're paying the correct amount of value for duty uh, based or value based upon the value for duty. In income tax, they want to make sure that there's a correct amount of profit in Canada so that they can tax appropriately and that may those two objectives may uh, conflict from time to time david yeah i guess one uh, quick example is many companies run afoul of this not knowing that they have valuation issues and it, it happens where you have a non-resident importer bringing goods in for inventory purposes from overseas um, into a 3pl in canada everything's fine and this day and age with supply chain issues and lead, long lead times, often the customers will sell through the primary goods and that, that 3PL no longer has goods in Canada. 
And what happens if you're a marketing driven company, you don't want to uh, have stock outs and uh, lost sales. So they realize that they have goods in a warehouse that they own and they operate in the United States. They transfer those goods up to Canada. Now, as a broker, we don't, you know, we see the invoice. Uh, however, we're not sure um, until there's a valuation issue with uh, customs, how did the, um, um, the uh, vendor in the United States um, value those goods to transfer them to their 3PL in Canada? You can't use the price from overseas, but they get into a valuation issue, not even realizing that they're, they're offside on anything. And it only comes up when customs takes a look at uh, goods that are coming in from overseas and goods coming in from the United States. So it's worth looking in your closet to see if, you know, do you run into issues where you uh, have, you're out of stock at your 3PL and you transfer goods from the United States. So. Okay, so next slide, please. Uh, arm's length principle, basically, there's, uh, uh, there's a way of, uh, of testing uh, whether or not the relationship between the parties has influenced the value. And I don't think it's uh, uh, important to go into the, the, the uh, nature of the technical rules, but you have to show uh, basically that the price that is being charged by the related party um, to the importer is consistent with um, uh, other prices uh, that a third party might charge. So if uh, a US Co is charging CanCo uh, $100, what would uh, US Co charge a third party? Would it be $100? Would it be 110? That's kind of the measuring stick that CBSA uses. Generally, I'm just uh, summarizing. David? Uh, and I would say if you need to get in this deeper, there are specific methods of valuation that customs agencies around the world are bound. There's six of them. Not going to go into um, what they are, but they're they're there. They're they're just not arbitrary uh, values that you can come up with. You actually have to subscribe to one of their methods of valuation. So. On to the next slide, please. Origin. Uh, the biggest issue we've seen in the origin sphere is uh, uh, free trade. Uh, eligibility, say under uh, NAFTA in the past, USA, MCA in the, in, in the current uh, state. And we're seeing more and more issues relating to other things such as the uh, comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, so uh, having a good handle on certificates of origin, statements of origin, especially where there's a high volumetrics that is, you've got lots of goods being sold at low value, but tons of them, or lot, uh, small amounts of high value uh, goods. That's important because uh, you know we, we're involved in, in uh, a few cases uh, where uh, the uh, statements have come under question by the CBSA, uh, so uh, and the CBP. They uh, have taken uh, a, a view that the uh, statement or the uh, certificate of origin is not correct. And the result of that is that the goods may not be eligible for um, a preferential tariff treatment under say uh, USMCA. And the result of that is that the importer gets a bill. So if you're an importer, and you're relying uh, on uh, goods, uh, on certificates or statements of origin from your supplier, try to have a, a recourse. Like, is there, do you have an indemnity agreement? Do you have an, a, a statement in your contract that you can uh, recover the duties if their statements or certificates are incorrect? Or, you know, can you get a level of assurance uh, from somebody that, uh, uh, that uh, they've actually gone through the analysis and, and somebody uh, of knowledge has done this. What is your method for managing that particular area of risk? David? Yeah, it's worth reinforcing again is that uh, brokers clear goods uh, based on uh, information they input into the custom system. And uh, when they're doing that, they um, most of the wording on whether they're mill certificates, um, their uh, um, uh, trade agreements, certificates, uh, statements of origin, is that those 
must be available at time of import. So if it's not available at time of import at the broker, however, the broker has been mandated by the importer, please declare it, declare it because our vendor says they're, they're in place. Um, when customers ask for it, again, they have not seen the documentation that, that's validating um, why you're getting preferred duty rate or, uh, uh, or statements that are made. So, um, and, and the best thing to do is make sure, like Dan's mentioning, that you have something in place with a vendor or best case scenarios uh, have that, uh, that those documentation available at time of release. Um, so um, again, customs has not seen that documentation and it's up to you to provide it on a timely basis. So. Yeah. On to the next slide, please. Uh, typical CVP audit issue, whether uh, goods are eligible for preferential tariff treatment under the USMCA. Uh, we have one ongoing right now where it's uh, pretty significant and um, you know unsupportable certificates or statements of origin. Uh, so says the CVP. Um, and the result is that it may, um, you know, trigger a claim if it turns out that it's um, that the CBS CBP is uh, is maintaining that particular position. So we'll have to uh, deal with that. But uh, if you could protect yourself going forward, I've seen in you know I know it's not always the case for small buyers, uh, small importers, but for larger importers, you might be able to uh, negotiate uh, a. Um, in save harmless or indemnity clause in your supply agreement, uh, which would um, save you a lot of hassles. Next, please. So consequences of failing, nobody ever wants to think about failing, uh, but uh, I'm just gonna put this in here anyways, so that uh, it's, uh, it's available. We've got to deal with corrections. There's um, assessments of duties and taxes, possible administrative monetary penalties. In the rare case, there may be seizure and forfeiture. Uh, I'm thinking in cases of non-report and that kind of stuff. And then increased border sc scrutiny, which in invariably means delays at the border and hassles. So nobody wants to be there. You wanna pass this thing and get on with uh, making money. Uh, corrections are generally required 90 days after a final verification report. Um, I recall that uh, you can make a, a time extension request, but you have to meet a three-part test, basically, that you always intended to appeal, but some, you know, horrible thing beset you and you couldn't make it, your appeal on time, um, and, um, and that you have a meritorious case, and, uh, and that, um, you know, there's a, another uh, a part of it which escapes me right now, but there's a three-point test which applies and you have to meet the statutory test or you don't get in. That is considered by the minister and uh, that means the CVSA. So they uh, get to uh, uh, um, give you the go ahead or no go. That can be, uh, I think, uh, appealed as well, but uh, you don't wanna be there. You wanna be in a situation where you're in time, 90 days uh, after the final verification report. David? I would just say that uh, you can plan to succeed and not fail in this in this regard, um, and also on the increased border security uh, scrutiny, the big issue these days is if you have um, a bit of a tarnished importing record, you may see your examination rate go up, which is uh, these days can be quite costly. Um, certainly on a container level, you're talking sometimes thousand uh, dollars to examine a container if they want a full D stuff. Uh, or three, four hundred dollars for a D stuff on a on a truck. So, um, and, and the thing is, is, if you have a fail, it stays on your record. So I would, um, above all, um, try to uh, um, make sure that uh, you don't, and that if there's issues that need to be corrected, correct them. And um, and and the other thing is, if you do fail, they are going to come back again to make sure you've done your corrections and have changed the way you operate. So. Um, it's not a one-off pass that they come through. Uh, they, they will take a look at you again, especially if there's irregularities uh, in the audit. So, Yeah, so you got de-stuffing charges and then demerge fees and all sorts of crazy stuff, right? Next uh, slide, please. Talk risk mitigation measures. Uh, 
do a customs review. I'd say you do it once a year. Uh, on, on measuring your compliance, you may get your broker to help you just kind of go through. Are you providing the right information, the right data sets? As the description of the goods change, have the goods change? Uh, are you changing your uh, supply chain method? So that you can, you can know with confidence that you're hitting the mark on these customs issues, valuation, classification, and origin. And make sure that your customs broker has all the correct information to do this job correctly. Uh, also ensure that your business has corporate knowledge and continuity in the event that even if uh, uh, tran uh, employees transition out of the business or in other, other departments, you got a manual, you've got a playbook to deal with the customs issues in the event of a verification or audit. Uh, think about supply agreements I mentioned uh, that shift risk to the supplier if uh, statements that they provide are incorrect and obtain rulings and, and legal opinions in complex uh, matters uh, where uh, you know, there is some doubt or there could be an interpretation that goes one way or another and reasonable people could disagree. David? Um, I guess my two comments would be, and, and I've, I've probably been stating them for the last 20 years, is <laughs> a custom self-review is a great starting point and something that I, um, it's a great for summer student or an employee within the company. And, once a year, just pick 10 random entries and the graphic that we gave you, just have them link up and, and just don't do it and isolate that. Do it, document it, put it into a binder. And when customs comes calling, say, hey, we're glad you finally picked on us for a customs uh, verification. We actually conduct an internal audit. Here's our binder. This is how we have the process. In a lot of those cases, you'll find that um, customs will not do a site visit. They'll do a desk audit because they understand that you have processes in place already. Um, and, and I guess the other one is um, a lot of times we have importers who only come to us when they want to do corrections, when it's a matter of the government's going to pay them money back because the declaration is in their favor. And I go out of my way to tell them, you know, it's really actually good to uncover a couple where you actually need to correct it because the um, uh, you actually need to pay customs um, um, a little bit of money because, you know, they, they often look to say, gee, you know, um, before they come in and do an audit, they, that they've uncovered that you do a number of corrections, but they're always in a position where the government's paying you money and they can't, they're kind of mystified that uh, there's never been an occasion where the government is owed money. So it's, it's, it's one of those that it's worth looking at and corrections on a minor basis are not always that bad with customs, so. Uh, let's uh, go to the next one, please. So here we go, uh, top 10 David Letterman style, uh, what to do uh, when they come for you, act like a duck, uh, timely response. Uh, number two, recognize the impact and get management buy-in. Number three, organize a team lead and assign roles. Number four, locate the source documents and information. Number five, identify any potential pitfalls uh, that you think might be uh, a focus of the verification or audit. Next slide, please. David, you want to pick this one up? Um, yeah, so if there are gray areas, um, don't go to customs directly. Seek timely advice, uh, it, whether internally or externally within your company. Um, and also you want to cooperate, but you want to ensure that the government stays in the scope of the verification. So if they're doing a classification audit and they've limited it to five entries, make sure that they stick within the scope. Um, because they're, they're mandate and they're bound by legislation that they have to stick to within those five entries. So um, also be ready to support your position um, uh, in writing or in a visit. I often um, instruct our clients, invite customs to come in. Now, it, for them to come in is a big undertaking. Uh, and a lot of times, if you seem very organized and you're supporting your position in writing, um, they, they'll often say, well, it's nice, thanks for the invite, but they won't take you up on it. Um, now, the other thing, and, and often we've gotten uh, Dan and his, uh, his firm involved, is if you run into a hard stop where you run a file of customs and um, there's some uh, large uh, uh, duty penalties, sometimes ant penalties, 
there's often negotiations are possible with CBSA. They're not in business to put, take, put importers out of business. And there's often wiggle room that attorneys, brokers um, uh, can help you negotiate with them. If, if you're taking steps to eliminate future um, issues, whether it's uh, uh, technologies let you down or it's, uh, um, but it's just one that, you know, you can't reinforce enough. You can negotiate. Now, um, from my perspective, Canada Customs has always been a little easier to negotiate than U.S. Customs. U.S. Customs sometimes is, is uh, they strike hard and fast and they want to be taken to court. So um, I would say number nine, big asterisk there in Canada, that's often possible in the United States, it's maybe a little less uh, advantageous. So, um, and, uh, and the bottom one is an adverse decision may be appealed. Uh, in many instances, and, and you, you, you should be aware, is that when customs uh, wraps up a verification, and certainly in Canada, they give you a preliminary um, decision. Many times that officer is conducting the audit on their, on their own, or maybe with a, a small group involved, and they haven't uh, reached out to subject experts in, the, in that, uh, specifically in that field, they're often wrong. And you're allowed to appeal that, which means they're forced to take it up the line. And we've, I would say between 15 and 20% of the cases I've been involved in is that at the initial level, something's uh, not quite, um, has been, has, hasn't been fully understood by the CBSA officer involved. And we've been able to get a, uh, a, a much better decision when they've taken it up uh, to their, um, their boss. So. Okay, so uh, there's a couple of questions in the chat before we move on to CARM. Uh, we can move to that slide if uh, you want, Gus. Uh, I'll try to quickly just hit them. Uh, and uh, again, as David's mentioned, uh, please send us an email or, or um, give us a call uh, off the meter. We can talk to you about what um, your questions are. Uh, the one question uh, was, uh, can customs come to a facility unannounced? Well, my experience is they don't do that unless they're doing something that's in the nature of a criminal investigation. And that can happen. I mean, I've had uh, situations where uh, folks, CBSA, have uh, had sent 20 officers to go seize documents and records in some office in Toronto, and they've made an allegation that there's some criminal wrongdoing. In that case, it was a question of... Uh, illegal uh, export of goods. So in that uh, case, the, the uh, first thing that you would do is call your lawyer and stand on your right to silence. Uh, and uh, so uh, that I won't get into in more detail because that's not really the focus of this thing. This is a civil audit. Criminal investigations are a whole different animal. Yeah, and, I, and I'll just mention, I've been in this uh, as a licensed broker almost 40 years. And uh, that's only happened once. And it was a very exceptional circumstance where customs, Canada customs uh, arrived unannounced. They'll always contact you in advance and find out a time that's agreeable. If it is US customs, they cannot come into Canada unannounced. They must ask the Canadian government for permission. Um, so it, it's probably 30, 60 days from when they contact you before they're ever able to come up and visit you. So. Yeah. And there's a question here about uh, how do you manage imports for Canada warehouse and from the U.S. CBP comes to the facility. We have training that lets them know who to contact in the U.S. I think that's probably a good idea, David. Do you have uh, some? Words yeah. So th that is uh, uh, is a slippery slope there, because uh, if you're um, a non-resident importer and you've signed that your books and records are kept within the United States, and your inventory is in the United States, um, by doing that, you've agreed that if they do want to come down to visit you, uh, you need to pay their expenses uh, uh, to their place of uh, um, where the uh, books and records are kept. Now, I have seen some of our clients offset that saying, with technology, you really don't need to come and see us unless you physically want to see the goods in the warehouse, um, because the information, even though it's maintained in one area, electronically it could be available anywhere else so um yeah uh, the, uh, another question is the certificate of origin where there's commingling of goods and we've had uh, this where uh, you know fasteners that are manufactured in the u.s 
are you know uh, imported into Canada, and then there's another supplier, maybe it's Japan or someplace, uh, someplace in Asia, and and then how do you keep track of that? And you've got to have a proper inventory management system, and if you don't, then um, it's time to figure it out because uh, that is often an issue, especially if uh, there is a claim for preferential tariff treatment under uh, NAFTA or the USMCA. David? Uh, I'm, that, that comes up sometimes. Uh, companies, um, unfortunately, they just have one SKU number for a product when in fact they should have um, multiple SKU numbers because the country of origin is moved from the United States to like you said, Japan or China or somewhere else. You can commingle goods, but you need to properly declare uh, the country of origin of, of the goods. Um, uh, so it, it's something that customs watches for. And it usually just comes up from companies oversight. It's usually oversight where they've had, you know, the uh, customer orders something and there's a SKU number for it. And all of a sudden they decide to start manufacturing another country. You should come up with a second SKU number because those goods are actually need to be reported as uh, from a, a different country. So. Uh, last question I'll mention is, uh, uh, it says, does customs entries require a type of flagging for import recon when uh, transfer pricing is involved with related parties? The way I see it is that transfer pricing enters the mix if there's a valuation audit, uh, and then if there's related parties, they'll consider uh, the, whether or not the uh, uh, relationship has influenced the um, value. And they'll consider any uh, transfer pricing study or you know that, those kinds of issues, the OECD testing methods and, and so forth. That's how it usually pops up. David, uh, do you want to do a quick ditty on CAR? So I this slide I've just put in there, and it's really just to uh, we're going to do a CARM session on um, March third, I think the same time, and it's really that. Uh, I'm, it's a plug about CARM that it's it's uh, Canada is going to a, a digital way to um, um, account for goods and it's nothing to do with release of shipments and it just gets into um, shifting burden from uh, brokers having um, surety bonds where it's going to shift the financial burden to the importers and this is coming down the pike right now the deadline is May of this year. Um, and it's really going to deal with um, importers dealing financially with CBSA rather than through their customs broker. So it's a radical change from what's transpired over the last hundred years in Canada. Um, I, I think it, there's a lot of good things that come out of it. However, a lot of the auditing and uh, those functions will be tied in through the CARM portal. So it's uh, uh, everybody uh, um, importing into Canada, you must get your own CARM portal. So certainly you can, um, you, you could just Google CBSA, go to CARM, you can reach out to our company or your broker and just, uh, you need to get in and get a CARM portal as soon as you can. Um, so, and maybe just go to the next slide. I'll, I'll just, I think I put a comment in there bashing the government a little bit, but uh, um, I, I like the approach by the government of Canada that they're, uh, they're modernizing um, this this process so that importers can actually see what they owe customs at, at, at all times. And also when claims and drawbacks are put in place, you'll be able to see uh, credits within your account. However, um, they, they pushed some numbers to the government that they said they're gonna save about $2 billion. Uh, um, uh, and, um, but I, I, I can't see where the savings are and when they've been pressed by trade associations have been lacking that, so. Um, but again, it, it's going to be karmas in the future will be a tool that's going to be used by CBSA um, to conduct verifications. And, and I, I think it may get a little easier because the financial information will be online, um, but it will become the starting point for verification audits in the future. So, Okay, well, very uh, good, David. Uh, just on time, uh, I guess I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. I hope you found this uh, session to be informative. Please reach out to us if you have any questions or comments for future um, webinars. Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, wish you a good day, David. Yeah, yeah, same thing. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, thanks, Dan, and your team at Miller-Thompson. I always enjoy doing these with you. And uh, 
Um, like Dan said, if you've got any specific questions, reach out to one of us. We'd love to help you. Um, take care. All the best, folks. Bye now.